The jungle looked so soft and easy from a B-25 upstairs. But now, downstairs, the jungle looks very different. And there's a five-man crew in it somewhere. This is Sergeant Mel Ford, the gunner. Just a kid who used to work in a flour mill in Spokane, Washington. And never spent a day in the woods in his life. Since all of them but the pilot bailed out together, there's a good chance of being heard if he yells. Hello there! Hello! Hello! No answer. Not at first. But a little later, he hears somebody else yelling. And then he sees him. The navigator, Lieutenant Pat McVeigh. A steady, dependable guy who'd been a high school football coach before the war. A good man to have around in an emergency. Hello there, sir. Hi. Here. How are you? All right? OK, fine. I, I... Sergeant Ford is worried about leaving his chute in the treetop, but that's OK. Since McVeigh has his chute, Forge will be a good marker for any searching plane to spot. Two more crew members. Four out of five accounted for. They're pretty lucky to have landed close by. If they hadn't, it would have taken a lot longer to get together. They have that much to be thankful for. And the nearest enemy positions are hundreds of miles away. McVeigh knows they're in a tough spot. But he also knows they stand a good chance of getting out if they keep their heads, and if they tackle the jungle as a problem to be solved, not something to be afraid of. The co-pilot, Lieutenant Pat Abbott from Pittsfield, Massachusetts, who'd been a little shaky, starts to relax. A good flyer and one of the leading amateur golfers in the country. But that seems a long time ago. And Charlie Tannen, radio operator and gunner. Oldest man in the crew, with a wife and a baby he's never seen back home in Amarillo, Texas. Before they jumped, they'd agreed to meet their pilot at the plane, if possible. They aren't too worried about him. They figure Harrison has landed closer to the ship, and he'll be there waiting when they reach it. But Harrison isn't doing too well. He'd come down pretty hard. And he's suffering from a mild form of shock. So it doesn't take much to rattle him. It starts with a mosquito bite. And then he steps into a termite's nest. It hits him suddenly. This is jungle. He's miles from his crew. Doesn't know where his plane crashed. And he knows next to nothing about jungle survival. Ignorance leads to fear. Fear and ignorance add up to panic. As soon as he protects himself from the swarms of insects, he takes stock of what he has, inspects his jungle kit for the first time in months, a little late. His mosquito gloves and head net are there, but his signal flares, and worst of all, his compass are missing. His fire starter is gone, too. No signal mirror. But he does have a machete, sunglasses, D-rations, pocket knife, fishing kit, and first aid kit. Because he hadn't been wearing a shoulder holster, he lost his 45 on the way down. His sleeping bag is there, but he has no map, no canteen, and no jungle survival manual. Not what he should have had if he'd checked his equipment before takeoff, but enough if he keeps his head. Shoes are a problem. He hadn't worn GI shoes, and his low-cut Oxfords snapped off when his chute opened. He's intelligent enough to improvise a pair from his seat pad cover. In jungle travel, feet are the most important means of transportation and need all the protection they can get. But panic makes him work too quickly, and his shoes aren't as good as they might have been.
An hour later, he's gone less than a quarter of a mile. And he has a serious transportation problem. Since he didn't watch where he put his feet, they're pierced by thorns and covered with stone bruises. His thirst is like burning pain. And panic makes him yell for Pat. Pat! yell when he knows he's miles from his crew. In desperation and anger, he fights the jungle. A futile battle which only exhausts him and makes him thirstier. And then, he throws away his water. He doesn't know the rough barked vine he cut, like many other jungle vines, stores water. Pure water absorbed by the plant's roots. But his crew knows you can drink from any vine that flows clear, sweet sap, and that you must not drink from vines with only milky sap. Tannen also lost his shoes when his chute opened. He too improvises a pair from his seat pad cover. But for greater protection, he makes an inner sole out of the padding and binds his feet with strips of parachute silk. These shoes won't stand up under rough jungle wear, so he'll carry extra canvas for new ones. McVeigh knows it's a good idea to keep the men busy, keep them from thinking and worrying. So he begins to take inventory the jungle kit is their most valuable piece of equipment. Among other things, it contains a frying pan insert, medical supplies, needle and thread, tea tablets and water purifier, signal flares, a compass, plastic water bottle and so forth. Basic equipment, which experience and testing have proven to be most helpful. There are several types of these kits and later models may vary slightly. Besides this kit, they have pistol belt first aid kits and parachute first aid kits and their parachutes. As much of the parachute silk as possible should be kept. It has unlimited uses. Once you land in the jungle, it's not so much what you have as how well you use it. Materials should be conserved. Wherever possible, jungle substitutes should be used, such as vines instead of parachute cord, bark instead of cloth, or taking your food from the jungle instead of using up your emergency rations. They have the necessities. And thanks to McVeigh's thoroughness, an additional emergency personnel kit he'd had the foresight to put in his pocket before takeoff. The emergency kit is sealed for protection. It's a handy thing to have, for it contains some valuable extras. D-rations, adhesive, matches, bullion powder, benzedrine, and a waterproof utility bag. You share alike in the jungle and divide your equipment into carrying packs suitable to each man's strength and condition so that every man is supplied if by accident he should be separated from the group. Under ordinary circumstances, keep together. Although a man alone can get out of the jungle, it's safer easier, and a lot pleasanter if you work in a group. There's a deep scratch in Abbott's back. The co-pilot doesn't think it's important enough to dress. But in the jungle, the danger of infection is magnified. It's hard to believe how quickly it can take hold. It's one of your most serious problems. To compensate for the loss of body salt through sweating, the kits contain a supply of salt tablets. They'll prevent heat exhaustion and cramps. Sulfonilamide powder, contained in the pistol belt first aid packet and the parachute first aid kit, is a lifesaver. Pouring it into an open wound will help control external infection and help prevent blood poisoning. The wound should be carefully bandaged. For relief from insect bites, rashes, burns, or skin irritations, the boric acid ointment is very helpful. It should be applied freely as soon as possible. For smaller scratches, use iodine. 
It comes in handy stick applicators, which are thrown away after using. You've got to keep your health. But you also need a plan. Studying the map, they work out their campaign against the jungle. They'll follow a stream and a river to their plane, where they should meet their pilot. Then, if rescue planes don't spot them, down the river to the coast, where chances of rescue are greater. But for a short time, they'll stay in the vicinity. Natives might come looking for them, if they'd seen the parachutes coming down. From flight data and time of crash, you have a pretty good general idea of where you are, especially if you have a reliable map. A compass will help when you travel. Even though it's still early, it's necessary to find a spot to camp, for night comes swiftly in the tropics. So they split up temporarily into two reconnaissance parties and agree to go only about a mile, searching for a stream, signs of native trails, or a native village. They blaze their trail as they go. In dense vegetation and tangled undergrowth, it's easy to travel in circles, even if you're jungle wise. Hey, what's the idea of lugging along that very pistol? Well, animals and snakes and things. A very pistol's swell for signaling, but it's not much good against animals and snakes and things. That part of the jungle is highly overrated anyway. You might see a few occasionally, but they won't bother you unless you start something. As for snakes, well, just watch where you put your hands and feet. Don't walk around barefooted. However, a forked stick is nice to have if you're unarmed and nervous. More important, it might be useful for catching small animals to eat. Yikes! That couldn't be a snake, could it? Yes, but it's not dangerous. It's just a boa constrictor. A boa constrictor? You didn't have to do that. His main interest is in getting away from you. There are a few poisonous snakes. This is a coral. Species vary in different jungles, so it's well to know the kinds in your theater. This is a Bushmaster. Even though he's the deadliest snake in the world, the odds that he or any other snake will bite you are about the same as you're being struck by lightning. So relax. An hour or so later, Tannen and Abbott come back without having found anything but jungle. Although it's hot and uncomfortable, and they're bothered by the strange jungle noises, they know now that jungle isn't as bad as it's been painted. Nothing like the exaggerated idea you get from too many Tarzan books. Tannen knows if you've got time on your hands, you want to keep busy. So he decides to lighten his pack. Every extra pound should be discarded. No reason, for instance, to lug around the padding in the jungle kit. So, cut it out. Abbott bones up on the jungle emergency manual in the kit and learns a few useful tricks. How to convert his parachute pack into a knapsack, for instance. The pack itself forms the carrying pouch and the web straps form the shoulder straps. Just a simple operation. It isn't long before McVeigh and Ford return with good news. They found a campsite not far from a jungle stream. So they get their packs together, make sure they haven't left anything they can use behind, and snake off single file into the jungle. They mark their trail well, in case natives or their pilot should cross it. Pitching camp near a stream puts fresh running water at their doorstep and gives them a front yard full of fresh water food. But to get away from mosquitoes and malaria, they pick a high spot a short distance back in the jungle. 
In making beds, the idea is to get a platform off the ground, above the jungle dampness and the insects. They make their beds by planting four stout upright poles in the ground. Supports and crossbars are tied down with strong jungle vines. For a mattress, palm leaves, or any large leaves at hand. And for sheets and blankets, the parachute. Silk sheets in the jungle. Not bad. With a whole jungle full of branches, wouldn't you know Mel Ford would pick one with thorns? Not only do the thorns prick, but they may be hollow. Queen ants sometimes lay their eggs inside them, and these branches are crawling. McVeigh also warns him about a plant with short detachable hairs on the pods. Hairs which will stick to your skin and cause violent itching. There are other plants to stay away from. Plants with thorns, barbs and stickers. But the little gunner's the kind of guy who'd sit in the only patch of poison ivy in five counties. And he did it too, back home in Spokane. It's a good idea to have a fire every night. Whittle some dry shavings. They'll burn easily. No point in using the fire starter unless it's really necessary. Save it for a rainy day. There'll be plenty of them. A dried termite's nest's a good base for the fire. Burn something like charcoal. Small twigs and bamboo husks make good kindling. Matches are scarce. Take precautions to keep them dry. And try to light your fire with only one. A fire has to be nursed along. It takes plenty of patience, but it's worth it. For jungle nights can get awfully cold. Besides giving you heat, a fire will keep away any kibitzing animals. Of course, fire is necessary for cooking, and its smoke will discourage mosquitoes and other pests. Finding dry wood is often a problem. Wood hanging from vines or standing dead trees may be dry. Wet wood can be split open and the dry heartwood used. Certain resinous and oily wood and palms, which are highly inflammable, will burn even if they're green. When the fire is well started, larger sticks should be laid on in a radial pattern. Burns better that way. Pretty, isn't it? But to Abbott, it's just a bathroom deluxe with built-in stall shower. Keeping clean is one of the best ways to prevent tropical skin irritations. Makes you feel better, too. It's still early enough so the mosquitoes aren't out in full force. But in an hour or so, toward dusk, it'll be too dangerous for Abbott to go around unprotected without all his clothes. A good thing for Abbott that McVeigh happens by. There are a couple of ticks on his back. McVeigh has to be careful removing them. A lighted cigarette held near a tick, not against him, will make him drop off. If you haven't a cigarette, put iodine on the beast or pry him out carefully with a knife. Ticks should never be squashed against the skin. Get the head out. Otherwise, it may cause serious infection. It's always a good idea to inspect each other at least twice a day for insects. You may look like a couple of baboons, but baboons do all right in the jungle. Iodines applied to tick bites at once to avoid infection. Since clothing gets damp quickly due to the high humidity, let it dry in the sun when you can, or by a fire before dusk. Before putting on his clothes, Abbott inspects them, particularly his socks and shoes, and liquidates any uninvited guests. McVeigh uses the waterproof cover of his sleeping bag as a water container. While he works, his legs are protected against ticks, ants, termites, chiggers, and other jungle pests, for he's tied his socks outside his trousers. He's doing a good job. Unfortunately, you can't say that about Harrison. Although it's almost four o'clock, late in the jungle, 
and he should have been getting set for the night, his only thought is to keep moving. Moving, in spite of the fact he doesn't know where he's going. He tries to orient himself, using his watch. The method is unreliable even in the temperate zone, and Harrison doesn't know it's useless near the equator. After a while, he learns from painful experience to go around obstacles instead of through them. He thinks he's getting smarter until he realizes with a sickening feeling in the pit of his stomach that he's passed the same spot twice. That's when he makes his first blaze. He might keep moving until nightfall, but by pure chance, he stumbles into a clearing, which looks like a good place to camp. The ground is covered with insects. So he uses his head for a change. He's learning slowly getting over his panic. But he's hot, tired, and thirsty. He hasn't had any water all day. He's dying for a drink. Yet he thinks this jungle pool is so brackish and polluted that his halazone can't purify it. He's wrong again. His crew knows halazone works wonders, if it's used properly. Two halazone tablets should be crushed and added to each quart of water. Shake the container thoroughly, then let it stand for half an hour. If you don't smell chlorine, add more halazone until you do. The water is then safe to drink. Water can be purified without halazone by boiling for at least five minutes. Mel has been left to guard the camp, while the rest of the crew is out hunting for food. To make a baking oven, he scoops a hole by the fire and rakes some coals into it. He's caught a tortoise. Poor, helpless little creature. He feels sorry for it. Tortoise should be baked whole in the shell to preserve the natural juices. Birds too can be baked whole, feathers and all, and then cleaned before eating. But they should be packed in mud instead of leaves. After the tortoise is placed in the scooped out oven, it's covered with a layer of dirt, which acts as insulation from the coals you rake over it. In two hours, a dish that would cost five bucks at the Waldorf. Tannin is searching for the vegetable course. Plants aren't as nutritious as animal food, but they're a lot easier to catch. Fern tips, good eating. The young tender shoots have the most nourishment. Like most plants, they can be eaten raw or cooked. Bamboo ovenware. A section of green stem cut below two successive joints is a good kettle. Closed at the bottom and open at the top. It's so durable you can boil water in it. For flavoring, some bouillon powder. At the same time, Abbott is busy gathering nuts. High in protein value, they're a good substitute for meat. Roast them or boil them. In gathering food, don't be afraid to experiment. Most plants are good. Only a very few are poisonous. A general rule to follow is if a plant tastes bitter, it's not edible. Try some. A taste won't kill you, even if it's poisonous. And you can always spit it out. Not bad. Sprouted nuts. A salad course added to the menu. These nuts are a symbol of the variety of food all around them. They're learning a valuable lesson. 
No man needs starve in the jungle. Look funny? Well, if you're tempted to laugh, ask yourself a question. Would I do any better in the same spot? Harrison's big mistake was made before he got in the jungle. He didn't learn how to lick it, and he wasn't prepared. He's smart enough to build his bed in a low tree, and he's well protected against mosquitoes. But hungry as he is, all he has to eat are his dried D rations. And what's more, he's worried about his crew. Worried about his crew. Yes, it's a peaceful scene. A good fire, good food, good companions. But there are enemies present. There are worst enemies in the jungle. The female Anopheles mosquitoes, which fly from early dusk to late dawn and carry malaria. Malaria, which has caused more casualties to American forces in the Pacific area than the Japanese. Malaria discipline must be maintained at all times, especially at dawn and dusk. McVeigh makes sure that after dinner, each man takes an Atabrin pill. While Atabrin or quinine won't prevent malaria, it will suppress it until you can get medical attention. There are directions for use on each package. Be sure to follow them religiously. The other rules of malaria discipline are practiced too. Insect repellent should be used and renewed every couple of hours. The Anopheles doesn't like it, and she isn't the only one. The repellent also keeps them from being bothered by other annoying insect pests. Mosquito head nets and gloves should be worn from early dusk to late dawn. The crew remove theirs only long enough to eat. Since they're well smeared with repellent and near the fire, it's all right. They're doing pretty well. I'm not too worried about their pilot because they figure that by now, Harrison's probably at the wrecked plane, waiting. Harrison's waiting all right for morning. He can't sleep. And he's still hungry while a good dinner crawls through his tree. As you can see, he'd be hard to catch. He moves so fast. And this lizard looks like a bad dream, but it's a tasty dish. Wild fruit hanging over his head, good to eat. There's enough food right near him, but he doesn't know enough to go after it. So he stays hungry. The crew have eaten well, but want to provide for the next day. So Mel Ford decides to make a trap. Just lengths of split bamboo arranged log cabin style and tied with parachute cord. A simple trigger stick will spring the trap. Small animals are more likely to be attracted by food unfamiliar to them. A sacrifice of a small piece of chocolate D ration for bait may pay big dividends. He knows that the best place to set a trap is along an animal run leading down to a stream. He camouflages it, and just to help things along, builds a fence to force possible victims in the right direction. If you're interested in birds or small animals, try snares. Use a strong, supple branch as a spring and make your cord from the inner core of your parachute shroud line. All animals and birds are edible except for carrion birds, like the vulture. So almost anything you catch will be good to eat. Tannen sets his snares on a wild berry bush, and a cluster of the berries makes good bait. He could use any other fruit he's seen birds eat. Like Ford, he camouflages his snares and builds guides to force the birds or animals in. Bird enters snare. Branch springs back. Meat on the table. He hopes. Jungle streams are usually well stocked, loaded with fish. There are other ways to catch them besides using the tackle in the kit. A blazing torch or flashlight attracts them, brings them within range. A dip net is improvised from the pilot chute, fastened around a bent branch. Any fish living in freshwater streams are good to eat. That goes for eels and frogs, too. Shellfish are good, like this crayfish, 
which, boiled, is as good as shrimp. There are a few poisonous fish, but they occur only in brackish or salt water. The backside of the machete can also be used to kill fish. By nine o'clock, which is very late for the jungle, they are ready for sleep, well protected against mosquitoes and with their equipment under cover. They plan to rotate guards during the night to tend the fire, and if a plane happens over, to signal with the very pistol. Sleep is important. You need more of it in the tropics. You've got to conserve your energy and keep up your strength as a resistance against disease. And while they sleep, the jungle is working for them. Shortly before dawn, a tropical rabbit on his way to the stream for a drink. He can't make up his mind. That chocolate might be good. No, it might be bad. Well, it might be good. Too bad. 